your service here this morning. It's good to have you with us. And we also say a special welcome to those folk who are joining us online. And we all hope that you will enjoy your time of fellowship together with us this morning. There's just a few announcements. Uh, just to say that on Tuesday from 10 to 12, the Knit and Matter will meet in the hall. And then on Thursday at 8 o'clock, uh, the MWI will be meeting here in the hall in the Navy. And the speaker is the Vice President, who is Olive Rowe. So all ladies are, uh, would be made very welcome to that on Thursday evening. That does mean that the prayer union um, will not be taking place this week, but it will be back again as usual uh, the following week. Then on Friday morning at 10.30, the prayer meeting and Bible study will meet in the hall with Philip. Uh, then next, and then on Friday evening at 7.30, the goals will continue as normal. Then next Sunday at 10.30, morning worship will be here as usual, and Mr. Colin Miller from Craig Moore will be along to take the service next week. So these are all the announcements you may remember them. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to, to be with you and to, to worship God together, to lift our hearts up as one in praise and adoration to him. Uh, just one more thing by way of announcement. The World Mission Reports and Envelopes are, are at the, the back of, of, of the church, so I would really recommend that you take them. There's a great, great, great read in it, and it's a, a wonderful cause to support. So let's stand and sing our opening hymn, Jesus the Name, Harry over all.
Jesus the name high over all. Lord, we gather in awe before your most wonderful holy name to which the powers of evil have no answer, at which they scatter and flee. We thank you that in that name for us who you trust in it, there is everlasting righteousness, acceptance and peace with God. We thank you that we want for nothing, that in you that we have all that is necessary for eternal life, security and peace. You're a good and wonderful and magnificent Saviour. Your love, our love is deeper and wider than, than we could ever get to the bottom of our exhaust. Your goodness is beyond what we can fathom. Our shelter, our refuge is in you alone. come this morning into your holy presence, all too aware that the, the sinfulness of our lives are exposed by it. We confess before you the impure thoughts we've had, the cruel and unkind words and, and deeds we have done, the much good we have left undone, the opportunities for, for witness we didn't have the boldness to take. We confess our sins to the one whose precious blood blots them all out. We thank you that when we fall you pick us up and you wash us clean. You wipe our, our slate clean, you, you give us a fresh start and enable us to, to cry out to you, to adore you, to, to praise you, to enjoy you, unhindered by our past. What a wonderful saviour we have that even by our own faults and feelings we cannot be separated from your love or have our eternal destiny robbed from us. We go forth in the security of that love to serve you and shine for you in this world. Lord, as a church family, we're mindful of, of those of our, our number who are unable to be here today because of ill health. We just ask for your healing hand to be upon you. For those who mourn, we ask that you would meet them afresh with your comfort. Lord, we think of all that's going on in our world at this minute. We think of our own situation in Northern Ireland with the Stormont Executive collapsed. We pray that you would just give wisdom and discernment to all our political leaders, that they would have a heart of, of, of humility and indeed compromise toward one another. They, they would find a way to come together to work for our good. And we pray that, that, that indeed the situation with the, the protocol can be resolved in a way that is, that is best for all who, who live here. We think also of the escalating uh, tensions on the border between Ukraine and Russia. We, we pray that a disastrous and bloody war in, in, that, in that area that it could be avoided. <coughs> that the, the political leaders on all sides will just step back um, from the, the brink and, and resolve their, their differences and tensions through diplomacy. We just trust that situation to your hand. And we pray for the, the church in that area, on both sides of that border, that, that they will shine for you, that they will be a, a beacon of, of, of peace and, and grace, that they will set an example that, that others can follow. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we just ask that through your Holy Spirit you would meet with us afresh and you would be glorified through us, your servants. 
And now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're reading this morning um, from 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 to 23. 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 23, continuing our series on King David. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrel, tim timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God, because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day the place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. My King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a, a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of the trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread and a cake of dates and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord, who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honour. 
And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. We thank God for his word to us. Before we look at this passage, let's stand and sing together, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. took the extraordinary risks they did. 
in an age of 24-7 rolling news, blogs and Twitter. We are on constant call wherever we are, but war reporting is still essentially the same. Someone has to go there and see what is happening. You can't get information without going to places where people are being shot at and others are shooting at you. That's not the real difficulty. The real difficulty is having enough faith in humanity to believe that enough people will care. When your file reaches the printed page, the website or the TV screen, Today we honour the frontline journalists who've died in the pursuit of the truth. They kept the faith as we who remain must continue to do. Marie put her life on the line day after day and in the end paid the ultimate price to bring us the truth about what was happening in war zones around the world. The greatest insult we could have given her was to be indifferent to what she reported. The greatest honour we could have paid her was to care enough to act, whether that action be petitioning our government or supporting aid agencies who are on the ground. Jesus Christ entered a world that was hostile to him, in which his life was continually under threat. And in that world, he willingly paid the ultimate price not to bring us the truth about what was happening in a war zone, but rather to bring us the, the life-transforming gift of God's presence. This passage asks us, are you indifferent to what he has done for you? Or do you care enough to act, to bow before him and to make the gift of God's presence the one and only source and fountain of your life? As we look at this story, we will see how we are to worship God and what the true focus of worship is. So how are we to worship God? We are to worship him in spirit and in truth. By approaching him as a, a sinner who has nothing to depend on apart from his saving mercy. The Ark of the Covenant, which lies at the centre of this story, was an ornately carved wooden box on which God's presence rested in the midst of his people Israel. For a number of years now, the ark had been kept in the possession of a man called Abinadab, who lived on the outskirts of Jerusalem. God's presence and purposes were peripheral to the lives of his people, as opposed to being central. But now that he is established as, as king on the throne, David admirably wants to put that right. He goes up to the house of Abinadab in order to bring the ark up to Jerusalem so that God and his revealed will might once again be what the lives of all his people revolve around. The ark is placed in a cart which is driven by Abinadab's two sons, Ahio and Uzzah. As they move out, there is great celebration and fanfare around them. All appears to be going well, until the oxen pulling the cart stumble. Seeing the ark is about to fall to the ground and be smashed to pieces, possibly. Yusa does what, what surely any of us would do in that situation. He reaches out his hand to steady it. What happens next is perhaps the most shocking incident in all of scripture. God repairs users seemingly good intentions by striking him dead on the spot. What on earth is going on here? What's going on is that user and everyone with him were indifferent to the holiness, majesty and awesomeness of God's presence. During the time that the children of Israel <coughs> moved about from place to place in the wilderness, after being delivered from slavery in Egypt, when the ark was to be transported, priests would enter backwards into the inner part of the tent in which it sat. 
Without setting their eyes on the ark, they would cover it with two layers of cloth and one layer of, of animal skin and then insert the, the carrying poles. Only after this was done would the people designated to carry the ark enter to pick it up, lest they touch it or, 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 or look upon it and as a result die. This was how God's presence was to be moved from place to place. As opposed to being carried on, on, on the back of a cart, like, like, a, like a piece of furniture, as a, as a spectacle for all to see. What God hates in our worship of him is not excitement, giddiness, or joy, but rather indifference to the holiness of his presence and the price it took to open that presence up to us. Just as Yuza could not casually move from putting his hand on the backside of an ox to putting his hand on the presence of God, we cannot casually move from using our lips to lie, slander and gossip to, to using them to extol the greatness of God. Following this incident, David leaves the ark aside in the care of a man called Obed-Edom. After seeing that God's presence was a source of, of gladness and blessing to this man and his family, David resolves once more to, to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. This time, however, he transports it in the way the law prescribes. It's carried in the correct manner by the people God designated it. And every six steps they take, David offers a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of all the people. In worship, we come before God not as his equal, nor as those who are deserving of his favour and acceptance, but rather as sinners completely dependent on his saving mercy which is given to us, not through the sacrifice of animals, but instead through the sacrifice of his only beloved Son. Approach God in complete reliance on the Saviour's cleansing blood by confessing your sins and feelings as you draw near. The spirit he calls to dwell within you will, will energize and empower you to worship in spirit and in truth with lips, hands and feet that are channels of the goodness and love of God which they extol. We're called to worship God in spirit and in truth by bowing before him as, as, as sinners who've nothing to depend on apart from his saving mercy that he poured out for us in the sacrifice of his son. What is the focus of worship? The focus is not our own dignity and respectability, but rather the glory and majesty of God. As David enters Jerusalem at the head of a great procession, he is dancing and, and, and making merry before God with, with all his might, like a giddy, over-excited child. He, he doesn't know when to stop or where the line is, when his wife Michal sees him from her window, she's embarrassed and disgusted by his behaviour. Later when David comes to greet her, she says this to him, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the servant girls as any vulgar fellow would. For Michal, Worship was all about her own dignity and respectability in the eyes of others. Her main priority as she joined in with the throng to praise God was to keep her emotions in check in order to avoid making a fool of herself. For David, his own dignity and respectability was neither here nor there when it came to worship. He wasn't conscious of how he was being perceived by others in any way. All his focus was on the glory and majesty of God. As he gazed upon it, he was intoxicated, overwhelmed, captivated by divine love. If 
Someone rejoiced in the presence of God this morning with uninhibited, unrestrained joy. In the same way that David danced and rejoiced before the ark on that day. Would you agree with Michael that that person was behaving inappropriately and embarrassing themselves? And having come to that conclusion, would you be sure, like she was, that God was in complete agreement with you and every bit as uneasy with their behaviour as you are? Look at the state of her waving her hands in the air, making it all about herself. Or equally, look at him standing motionless and without expression on his face as he sings Lost in Wonder and Love and Praise. There's no way he's lost in those things. If you have space in your heart to make these sort of conclusions in worship, whether your hands are in the air or by your side, it's because your own dignity is more important to you than God's. Because you're lost in yourself as opposed to being lost in him. Be indifferent to the glory of God's presence and the cost he paid to open it up to you no longer. Stop clinging to your, to your own image, to your own reputation, to your own honour. There's no lasting life, joy and security in these things. Make Jesus and his love for you the only source, focus and purpose of your life. Sheltered in his saving mercy that you can never exhaust, you will come across nothing that harms you. In everything that happens to you, even the, the difficult and, and harrowing things, you find a reason to rejoice and something to be thankful for. Because it's allowed to be there. To make you depend on God more, to cling to him more closely and thus it will lead to you receiving the new and greater blessings he has for you and the, the greatest use of your life that lies ahead. A minister once shared a story about a lady in his church. He was annoyed about pretty much everything that was happening in it. Every time she spoke to him, she would complain, the children, they fidget too much. The music's too loud. The prayers are too personal. The sermon's far too long. Each week she was going home from worship, frustrated and disheartened, instead of uplifted and encouraged. In an attempt to help her, one Sunday, the minister gave her a task. At the start of the service, he filled a glass of water to the brim and asked her to carry it round the whole sanctuary without spilling a drop when he got on with the proceedings. Ten minutes later, she arrived back at the front. Pleased as punch that not a drop was spilled. The minister asked her, Did the fidgeting of the children bother you? Did the beat of the music annoy you? No, I hardly noticed these things, she replied. Why do you think that was the minister pressed further? Because I was totally focused on the glass. Focus totally on Jesus Christ. And the things that annoyed you to the point that they ruined your day or your week, they'll become inconsequential to you. But what does it mean to focus totally on Jesus? When the sermon's incoherent and hard to follow. When a song is too repetitive or, or too loud or, or, or too soft and quiet. Don't sit back and pick faults. The only soul you're harming by doing so is your own. There's bound to be at least one phrase of precious truth. Even a broken clock is, is right twice a day. Fix your heart on that, and you will be built up. 
if you've been wronged by a brother or sister. Don't play over and over in your mind what they did to you, making it worse every time. Instead, play over and over in your mind what Jesus would have you to do to bless them, making it better every time. In the grace and strength you supply, step out in faith to do it, and you will be set free. When our focus is on Jesus, the things that depleted and crushed our soul become the means through which our soul is replenished and blessed. What a wonderful saviour we have. Why cling any longer to your own image, respect, reputation and dignity in which there's no lasting life when you can cling to Jesus now? Let go of everything you hold to, everything you live for. Make Jesus the only source, the only focus, the only purpose of your life. Sheltered in his saving mercy, empowered by his spirit, grasp joyfully, enthusiastically, but with both hands, the, the, the gift of God's life-giving presence he gained for you. You will miss out on no good thing as you devote the rest of your life, like David, to doing what you were made to do, which is worshipping God with freedom and joy, with sincerity, truth and holiness, with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing together to God be the glory.
As sinners, you have no other hope apart from your saving mercy. We have come in complete dependence on your grace. And with all our hearts, as we are, we have worshipped you. We thank you that you see our hearts and you accept our worship that is offered in dependence upon you. Lead us forth in that spirit of worship to live lives that extol your greatness, your love, your goodness to everyone who encounters us. Our hope is not in what we can do, but in what you have done for us. In your majesty and wonder, we are lost. We are captivated and we stand in awe. May we continue to know the freedom and joy of lives that worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>